I'm still opening stuff, but that's never yeah, stopped no, I haven't, before. I haven't my, my recording either. I got to get Audible going. But <clears throat> anyone watching can not Audible, Audacity. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Uh, I'll be fine. So we should figure out. Yeah, we should figure out what we're gonna do with the the episode that we did with with Paul. Matt Sutter, uh, which was all in Cosmic Voids. I guess we'll make that one 389, and then, mm -hmm. so this one will remain 388. Cosmic Voids will be 389. But there will be, and it, I guess it'll just end up being a bonus episode or... or well, we didn't have an episode last week, so it, it will fill in for the one we didn't record. Right, okay, okay. So we can release... This one and the other one whenever Preston gets them done. Oh, I'm a bad host. I should put on my earphones. Yes, you should. You're echoing. No. It's okay. you. You're Me. echoing. Echo, echo, echo. What we do in life echoes into eternity. Uh, no, just into my headphones. Yeah, and I'll turn off. I'm going to mute my... Yeah. That's good. Now we're now we're cracking. This is going to be the way. And I hope we're amusing all of you out there watching the beginning. The, 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 the viewer. There is the view. Oh, so there's six viewers now. <laughs> those those six. Hello, six people. Yeah, the six. We like our six people. Um. Oh, 16. All right. Well, then this is this is getting <laughs> this is getting almost real. Um. 18. We'll go another couple of minutes and then uh, we will begin the episode ning. Mm -hmm. Yay. I think it's uh, here. Did I already <clears throat> post? I'm having a moment of not knowing where I've posted things. So I may be spamming did you, people. Did you tweet it? Did uh, you? I did tweet. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to watching Astronomy Cast get made. Uh, in our new world where we don't try to be super professional with the beginnings and instead we just sort of turn on the the camera and turn on the stream and let you be a part of everything that's going on you're watching us make astronomy cast right now uh so today we are going to talk about megastructures which of course this is our shameless clickbait way of jumping on the bandwagon of all the people who are talking about uh the recent uh, discovery of uh, weird things around a star, which may or may not be megastructures. We'll talk about that. Uh, probably not. Uh, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about, but then we will follow Fraser's crazy imagination trail. Everybody get on board the imagination train um, and we'll talk about the other crazy ideas that, uh, that aliens might use to, uh, to really change the, the surroundings. What what could aliens build at the largest scales that you've never even thought of and will blow your mind? Actually, I've thought a lot about this. So, um, as I mentioned, you get to join my crazy imagination train. Uh, this is a live uh, thing that we do here. This is actually happening. Well, it's a couple of seconds delayed, but uh, just to demonstrate, I'm going to say hey to Elad Avron, Helga Bjorkog, Brandon Musa, John Marcello, uh, Jim Meeker, Guido Bibra, Leonard Lindstrom, Sylvan Westby, Ed Thompson. Did I say Thomas Tranaker? If not, there you go. James Jim, Gibbs. I have a box from Jim. I haven't opened it yet, but I have oh. it. I okay, just hooray. suck at physical reality. Michael Jobin, Stephen Walker, Nancy Graziano, Curry the Vegan, Tom Nathy, Phil Wilcox, Michael Thompson, Rick Schwartz, Douglas Crandall. Wow, there's a lot of people today. Um, Mike Kay, Todd Howard. And I believe that's everybody. So, um, yeah, so here we go. We're going to do a what? Giorgio A. Tsoukalos impression? I don't know who that is. Is that some megastructure person? I don't know. Okay. Uh, is there, uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So we're going to take about half an hour. Uh, I will like try to constrain this down to a half an hour, even though my heart and my imagination wants to talk about this for days on end. But that's what we'll do. Uh, and then we'll take some of your questions about either the topic we discussed today or just in general about space and astronomy. 
And the missing episode, which is three, now we've decided it's going to be 389. This was our conversation with Paul Sutter about Cosmic Voids, and it's excellent. It Paul is. It really is, a, is. Paul is a really knowledgeable guy uh, and hilarious and very, uh, I see a big future with that kid. Um, so um, we're going to uh, sort of th drop that in the feed. And if you haven't already, uh, if you want another uh, podcast to listen to, check out his Ask a Spaceman podcast. He's, uh, like I said, he's a, he's a rising star. And it runs as part of 365 Days of Astronomy. So check that out while you're at it. Yeah, if you haven't already heard it, if you're just listening to 365 Days of Astronomy. Okay. I say we do this thing. Okay. All right. It's going to happen. Okay. Um, I've always, it's been so long now. Uh, I believe I pressed record on my recording device. I pressed it, and now it's actually doing something. Testing, testing. I yes. have a dog that's very loudly barking. All right. I have I have people calling me all day to remind me to go vote. Hey, all you Canadians, go vote. Yes, definitely vote. All of you, vote. Americans, remember, you do have voting coming up shortly. Um, okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 388, Megastructures. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. It was so great to see you in person. It uh, was. Yeah, so for those who don't know, last week, uh, as of when we're recording this, Pamela and I were in person at OSU, thanks to uh, Paul Sutter from Ask a Space Band podcast. He, he hosted us and put us to work uh, doing, I did a seminar, uh, we did a live show with, uh, with astronauts, and uh, it was awesome. We had a great time. And uh, there is a missing hidden episode, episode 389, that we actually recorded with Paul Sutter, and that's going to just show up in your feed. There's no video to go along with it. It just, we just plonked a microphone down on the table and we did an episode all about cosmic voids. So hopefully that's going to be what's going to come up next week. Yes. Or intermediately. It's likely to be an intermediate episode. A hidden episode. Sneaky a hidden episode. Hidden. Yeah, yes. exactly. A bonus episode. Um, okay. Any other, any other announcements? Um, for those of you who are watching this live, there is the White House Star Party today here in the United States, and there are satellite events all across the United States. So uh, check out what's going on near you. There are people with telescopes looking to show you a little bit of the sky. All right. Well, this week, astronomers announced an unusual transit signal from another star. Although it's most likely a natural phenomenon, one remote possibility is that this is some kind of alien megastructure. Freeman Dyson and others have considered this idea for decades. Today, we'll talk about the kinds of structures that aliens might want to build. Now, we were super fortunate when this news came out that we did the Weekly Space Hangout on Friday, and uh, Kimber Kimberly Cartier, who is the second author on that paper, is one of the regulars on the Weekly Space Hangout. And so she was there to talk about it for 20 minutes, and we asked a lot of questions. So if you want to hear, like, literally from the source, check out uh, the last episode of the Weekly Space Hangout the one that came out on on October uh, 16th? Yeah. Yeah. But for those who, you know, uh, too long, didn't listen, uh, can you give the short synopsis about the news that came out uh, this week? Yes. It uh, came out last week, and it appears that there is a star in the Kepler field that is in a non-periodic kind of way getting brighter and fainter, and the way it's getting brighter and fainter looks like multiple objects passing in front of the star. Uh, they've done follow-up observations trying to figure out, is this sunspots, is this weird something natural about the star? And so far, all of the things that they've tried to match it to aren't working out. And the best they can figure is there is something physical 
an object set of some sort that keeps passing in front of the star and there are multiple of them doing this in a way that is really hard to model and doesn't look like anything we've previously seen in nature. So if it's a natural event, it's probably an extremely short-lived natural event. So the kinds of natural events that we're talking about would be things like uh, a cloud of comets moving past the star. I mean, they've already ruled out that it's planets on funky orbits. So the ideas are having to get pretty out there now. Yeah, and and this is where people end up, because we do know it's a low probability event, uh, end up jumping to the most wild of all the low probability events. So right. one one of the, the things, as you alluded to, was perhaps this star passed near another star recently, and this triggered a whole onslaught of comets from that star system's version of the Oort cloud, and these are all plunging in on mass. Uh, kind of dramatic, kind of crazy. Um, but the alternative hypothesis is, what if this is a bunch of man-made structures? Alien-made, yeah. So in, yeah. in you know, normally we would be very skeptical. We'd be toning it down. We'd be telling you that, you know, the chances that it's aliens is super remote. But today, Fraser's imagination is taking the driver's seat. And so we get to just go off into crazy places to uh, to think about this. So... All right, so then to then why is this one of the theories that's been posted is that this is somehow an um, you know a an artificial created megastructure by some alien civilization. Well, it, so the the probability that we're looking at the aftermath of planets that collided and left behind big old pieces of shrapnel or that it is a incoming swarm of comets these are all low probability things that live if they happen for a very short period of time comets self-destruct planets reassemble um and at the same time the chance that a civilization that's older than our own might have had time to start mining their asteroids into giant structures um doesn't seem like it's necessarily that much more improbable. Now, the thing is, we have no idea what the frequency of life is, what the frequency of civilizations are. So for all we know, it is much, much more common for there to be megastructures out there than for there to be planets colliding. And we don't know. And it's that not knowing that makes it impossible for us to say, what is the more improbable explanation of what we're seeing? Okay, so let's go back then and let's talk about some of the kinds of structures that future civilizations might build and then maybe how we would go about actually looking for these things. So we're going to stay completely in the laws of physics here. We're going to try anyway and really talk about uh, sort of what is the, you know, what is the end state what is the 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 thing that the most sophisticated most powerful most you know the aliens with the most mastery over their physical environment could do with the raw materials that they have at their disposal so let's sort of start something that's maybe closer to where we are today what kinds of structures could you know in the next few thousand years maybe some kind of alien civilization put together well, so so the most obvious is your giant Star Trek class space station, something out there that is comparable in length to the size of the moon. Think Death Star, but friendlier and uh, maybe more tubular so that you can have all the spacecraft docked up nice and tight. Um, there's the giant spinning ring philosophies. So... Uh, depending on how you want to do it, you either build something that is perpendicular to the sun and spinning that is fairly small, perhaps the size of a planet. Uh, and because of that spinning, it's able to create artificial gravity. You put inner walls on that ring and it keeps its own atmosphere inside. But if you are a sufficiently large civilization with sufficiently large heavy moving equipment, instead of just building a planet sized spinning ring that is in orbit around a star, why not build a ring around the star? 
And some people will then go as far as say, well, let's just enclose the whole darn star. And that's where we get back to something we've seen in Star Trek, a Dyson sphere. Right. And so, you know, the Dyson, Freeman Dyson sort of came up with this idea. Who knows if people had had sort of imagined it beforehand. But the idea, right, is to try and capture all of the energy that comes from a star. Right now, we we only collect a tiny, tiny fraction of the energy that's given off by the sun. It goes off into space, worthless, worthless space. We should be capturing that energy and then using it to fuel our our plots and dreams. So, so you know, what would sort of an, an actual Dyson sphere require? An actual Dyson sphere is extraordinarily complicated to build because you're dealing with, first of all, different amounts of gravity at different points inside the sphere. So, so you have a sphere rotating. We've all spun up a globe before. Now, if you think about where you have to be moving the fastest in order to make it all away around that axis, you end up with heavier gravity down in the equatorial regions and you have up towards the pole. This causes the atmosphere to lump up along the center. And in order to get that full sphere going, um, well, first of all, you have to figure out all of the physics of giant doors in and out because you figure you're probably going to want to explore the rest of the universe occasionally. You're going to want to look out occasionally. You have to figure out how do you distribute mass so that you're not crumpling your structure? How do you uh, deal with all of the weather that's likely to form? It, it's structurally kind of a nightmare because you do have this gradient in force being exerted on the ring, gradient in mass piling up across the ring. And then there's things like you're probably going to stick all of your light collectors that are obscuring their, your surface in those low gravity polar regions. And it just goes on and on in terms right. of nightmare after nightmare. Right. Now, when you're talking about sort of the low gravity regions, right, like, like say you actually enclose the whole star in a sphere. Yeah. And then you set that sphere turning to provide some kind of gravity, mm -hmm. right, artificial gravity. It's only going to be felt right at the equa equatorial sections, and then as you go further towards the north or south pole, you're going to have less and less gravity until, if you were actually at the north or south end of this sphere, no there would be, there would be no gravity, yeah. and you would you would sort of fall down, and then you would sort of to places where there would be higher gravity. So because the and I think someone did the math right that if you took the entire solar system dismantled it you could only get a sphere that was about 20 centimeters thick and that's not going to do it for you. Right. And so like what is the physical stuff, you know, what what uh you know, what material in the universe if you could turn the entire solar system into the toughest material in the universe could you build a a rotating sphere the size of the earth's orbit? And have it hold together with these kinds of of stresses and tidal forces and stuff. It just wouldn't work. No, no. And and with the technologies that we know of today, you'd probably be wanting to build it out of carbon fiber. And we just don't have enough stuff. And and even if you put all of your stuff into building the sphere, you're still going to want to have houses and cities and you're going to need to have agriculture. So you're going to have to have thick dirt in some places. And why are we going to kill all the whales? You probably want to have oceans. And, and this is where reading in science fiction, we find lots of alternate answers. This is where we find Larry Niven's ring world, which is, is one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, instead of building a sphere just build the part that matters that equatorial region right and i think in in niven's book right they, there was like a a wall around the edge of the ring like imagine a ribbon that goes all the way around at the earth's orbit and then it's covered with a you know with walls on the edges of the ribbon and then this thing turns the the atmosphere is kept in by these walls around it the turning gives you that gravity and the thing should theoretically work. But I, I think even in Ringworld, Niven admitted that the, you know, that the stresses, there's no way you could keep the thing perfectly balanced. It would eventually tear itself apart. Right, right. And, and so this is a matter of 
have we just not figured it out? And if you think about it, it took humanity a little while to figure out the beauty of the arch, to figure out how to build the uh, bridges like the Golden Gate Bridge that have these beautiful arches of, of cables that support the bridges beneath them. Um, and technology continues to advance to the point that we now nominally have the capacity to start building kilometer high buildings, but to the pioneers building everything out of brick and rock, that's an impossible thing to conceive of. So who knows? Yeah, but the you know these concerns have absolutely been considered by, and even Dyson considered this. And so one of the other ideas is to build what's called a Dyson swarm. Have you uh, have you looked into this at all? I. Uh, it's it's not I, I have to admit I tend to go down more of the Babylon five, let's have right. a spinning cigar instead. But well you get both, right? So yeah. so with a Dyson swarm, you are still dismantling the solar system. So as one does. System, as one would need to. But then what you do is you build so essentially satellites, solar satellites that that act like a like a big cloud around the sun. And so these are all in all different orbits, but they overlap in such a way that you collect a big chunk of the energy that's coming out from the sun, but but there's no requirement for this structure, right? Because they're not attached to each other; they're just they're just flying past and and collecting the sunlight. And there's always coverage. So if so if the sunlight gets past the one cloud of satellites, it gets to the next one, and they capture it, right? Um, and then the and then for for habitation, back to the rings, the spinning rings. So you could set up, you know, at at various places big O'Neill cylinders with the the open end pointed towards the sun and they're just spinning. So you wouldn't, nothing would be connected, but you would maximize the habitableness of the solar system by just kind of dismantling everything and reorganizing it into a structure that really worked. And, and I, I love the way you see dismantling our solar system into a bunch of solar panels and spinning rings as an improvement. Um, not sure I agree with you there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so so the, the key where we get stuck is how do you take solar energy collected from all of these panels and distribute it to all of the societies that are now living in spinning rings, the Martian style, except much bigger. And here you start to have perhaps uh, more of what you see in Neil Stevenson's uh, Seven Eves, where you have a whole collection of different subsocieties, each in their own solar system, and figuring out uh, this one lives on this panel, this other one lives on this other panel. And do you then end up with genetic drift from one base station to another? Or they're beaming energy at each other with lasers or whatever, right? There's going to be some kind of math that they figured out that it's better to live at the, you know, where the panels are, or it's better to beam it to another place. So, um, so now this all just sounds like just future and, you know, future magic technology. And it is, but what's kind of interesting about it, and this is sort of where it comes back to the story that happened this week is that, is that these kinds of things could be observed, right? And and they could be observed and they could be a necessity. I, we look at our own solar system, or at least I look at our own solar system as a perfectly beautiful place that is currently not trying to kill me too bad. So let's keep the planet Earth going. But if you have read Neil's, uh, Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves, um, and I don't think this is a spoiler, I'm pretty sure it's on the back of the book, um, the planet Earth becomes uninhabitable for a large chunk of time. And because of that, and because they're given some prep time ahead of time, um, we become a spacefaring civilization just to save our own genetics. And it could be that other civilizations have already hit that horrible, oh, we need to be out among the stars now dilemma that leads to megastructures is the only way to keep going. Um, 
And now we're looking for them as, well, earthbound ones are probably leaking radio and spacebound ones are probably using encrypted point to point communications as a good civilization should. Um, but they're not radiating normally. So what do you mean like not radiating? Like, like wouldn't, like what would the signature, the, the, you know, if you looked at a star that was surrounded by some kind of megastructure, some kind of cloud, massive space station, uh, you know, what things would look different than when you look at a regular star? So, so when we look at our own sun, we see that it has this beautiful black body distribution of light that tends to peak in the green and everything is nice and smooth. But if you're surrounding that with more and more solar panels, so solar panels are going to be absorbing out high energy light, the visible colors, the ultraviolet colors, and all of the surfaces of your megastructures are going to be warm. And so they're going to be giving off light in the infrared. Now, planets do do this too, but planets have orbits we kind of understand and megastructures well, they're going to have those same high uh, infrared, I'm a warm thing radiation properties, um, but they're not going to do it in a way that looks like the way a planet does it. And so using like maybe an infrared telescope and looking at these stars, you would see stars with a really strange energy signature that it would be leaking a lot more infrared, a lot less visible light, and it would be a really a real telltale sign that there's something very strange going on around that star. Well, if you have a ring in particular, it would look like two superimposed black body curves, one at the temperature of whatever the heck that ring is at, probably something resembling Earth temperatures. And then the star would be trying to radiate away in the temperature the star is at, which is going to be much, much warmer. And if we had a binary system or a planet, you'd see these two black bodies fading and getting brighter as one passes in front of the other. But if it's a ring, it's permanently superimposed and never changing in brightness. And that just doesn't occur in nature. And the other part as well is like, you know, with Kepler, it uses this transit method to, to spot objects moving in front of it, of the parent star and try to figure out the, you know, the, how long did it happen? How big is the planet? What's its mass? Things like that. But, but in fact, different shaped objects, like if you had a triangle pass in front of a star, it would give off a different light curve than yes. a circle or a square or, or some other kind of unusual shape. And, and the way to think about this is if you have, a spherical object that is moving in front of another object. I'm apparently going to eclipse my face for those of you watching online. Its curved edge will cause a smooth decrease in the amount of light that is actually curved in how it's decreasing. So there's this as the amount, it's a, it's a geometric blocking. Now, if instead it is a triangle coming in, you'll have a sharper edge. It, it all has to do with how you do the math. Sphere is going to be a pi r squared. Triangle, it's, it's just different. Um, it becomes a geometry nightmare, but we know how to do geometry. Right. And I, I think one of the really interesting sort of science that's been done is astronomers have figured out they could look at things like they could look at the light falling on a planet or looking at the light falling on its exomoon. Like once they get powerful enough and then try to get a sense of like how much illumination, if there's cities on that planet, if, you know, if you have like some kind of Coruscant, you know, Coruscant, I don't know how you say Coruscant. it. Coruscant from Star Wars, right? We get a you get a planet that's that's an entire city that would give off a different light signature than one that had oceans and darker colored uh, mountains and things like that. Ice. And, and we've simulated this with our own moon. We've we've actually uh, unfocused telescopes looked at the moon, looked at the variations in light of the moon as the Earth rotates um, to try and figure out can we reproduce the distribution of light on the earth? And we can to a certain degree. It's not a perfect science, but it's a starting point. Now, one of the future sort of 
thought process is if you if say you have some alien civilization and they uh you know they convert one solar system into some kind of dyson sphere dyson cloud dyson swarm that gives off that infrared signature and then they move to another solar system and they move to another one and then they they eventually theoretically if there's no reason to stop them they would colonize and convert their entire galaxy into whatever i guess you know whatever composition whatever structure made the most sense to them and and what i think is really super fascinating again astronomers have thought about this that would give off an infrared signature but it would be a galaxy wide and actually there was a recent survey done with nasa's wise telescope to look for i think they, they studied ten thousand galaxies to see if any of them were were a place where some future alien some alien civilization had colonized the entire galaxy like that and and one of the interesting questions that our failure to ever turn these things up brings up is well, we know that we're only 13.8 billion years post Big Bang. What if civilizations are just starting to emerge and everyone struggles with dark ages the way we did just in their own way? Um, it could be that even though we're not finding these things today, that someday in the future, our civilization, as well as numerous others, will begin to meet along these intergalactic highways. And one of the weird things to me is, is that if we do if, if we do find more evidence and it does turn out to be some kind of megastructure, then why hasn't aren't there more? Why isn't the entire Milky Way? Why isn't it completely colonized in the way that you know that they've already done one? It won't take a couple more million years, a billion tops to colonize the entire galaxy. It would be so weird for us to only find one and not find them all over the place. And then you wonder why hasn't our solar system been turned this way? Uh, there's there's one other te technology, sort of a futuristic technology that I think is really interesting, um, which is this, it's called a Shkadov thruster. I don't know if you've seen this no. at all, but essentially which it's like a Dyson sphere, but you only enclose half the star with the Dyson sphere. And then what you do is then the gravity of the sun is pulling the sun towards this this mega structure, this mega structure, this half shell, and so, but the light pressure from the star is pushing away this mega structure, and what that causes, it actually causes the sun to follow, to be pushing and following this mega structure around, and over the course of about a billion years, you could pretty much reposition any star you wanted in the entire galaxy. With and, and and this is again something that you see popping up in various science fiction, the idea of rearranging even the stars to the shapes you want, perhaps artisan style to form different geometric shapes. And then it starts to become a question of do other societies fear like we do being discovered? Uh, there, there was the interesting idea put forward that the reason we haven't found alien societies is because they use the cosmic microwave background radiation for their encryption patterns and all of their signal disappears into the background noise. Um, it may be that we don't spot other civilizations because they don't want to be spotted. But they do still live in the laws of physics. And so yes. at the end of the day, heat is the thing that you really can't get rid of forever completely but if you're not moving your stars yeah and if you're more of a i'm going to build giant rings that don't circle stars entirely you do make yourself harder to be seen yeah absolutely um and sort of one of the the sort of really sort of futuristic ideas that i like to think about uh is this idea of, of computer you know, imagine in the future we have some kind of you know when when the robotic overlords take over and uh, and they start to colonize the the Milky Way, that they may eventually turn whatever they can get their hands on into more computing power. You know the term is like computronium, and so you can imagine some kind of future robotic species reaching a uh, a planetary system, dismantling the entire thing, turning it into the most efficient computer. And then moving on to the next one and literally rearranging everything within the Hubble sphere into 
whatever's the most efficient computer system. So, so the crazy thing about all of these notions is they require societies to be anti-environmentalism, to be against protecting our natural wonders. You can't keep national parks and dismantle your entire planet to form a Dyson sphere. Those are incompatible ideas. Yep. And one idea that isn't generally discussed that could be why we're not finding any of these things is maybe like uh, out of the hominid series of books, maybe other intelligent societies out there aren't out trying to war against their environment, but are being more peaceably living within the environmental constraints of their world, advancing their society and their civilization without destroying everything they see. Yeah. So I, I think if there's one, if you enjoy these concepts, I think there's a tremendous amount of really great science fiction to talk about it. Uh, you know, you, we talked about the ring world series, which is wonderful. Uh, the Rama series from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, you mentioned, uh, some steel, some Stevenson books. Seven Eves is a good one. Uh, I'd also recommend, um, the hominid series. I'm, blanking entirely on who the author is just to look at a comparison between how two different civilizations can adapt in parallel um yeah there's a lot of different options out there for what our future could hold yeah absolutely hopefully then uh, this will give everyone context as they're looking at uh looking for updates from this uh, pretty interesting discovery uh, we're not saying it's aliens. No, we're saying it's something that's low probability. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Pamela. My pleasure. And now we save. Save. And I see people mentioning new YouTube notifications. I did not know about this thing. This no. is a new and exciting thing. Yeah. We've mentioned in the past that uh, the problem with Hangouts and, and such is that it's literally impossible to know when uh, things are actually happening live. It's crazy. Okay. While things like... Uh, uh, Periscope, Meerkat, you know, they do a really great job of saying, hey, you know that thing that you really love? It's happening right now. Click this link and watch it happen. So. So hopefully YouTube is catching up to that and everyone has installed yeah. the YouTube app on their phone and subscribed because if you don't mm -hmm. subscribe, you won't get a message. So yeah. subscribe. All right. Let's, uh, I'm saving, I'm saving. I'm safe. Okay, uh, let's take a look at some questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, Alan Scalpone asks, do you have any idea the size of the object blocking KIC phone numbers light? No, because it's confusing, and so we don't have a good distance away from the planet. Without a good distance away from the planet, all we can say it's big. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, so Lars Rai Jepsen says, I believe in a YouTube notification functionality is one of the reasons for bigger live audience. I am here because of a notification. Usually I miss the show, but never again. So if someone can post in the, the Q&A just some instructions on how to make sure you get those notifications. So if you're not getting notifications for our live stuff and you want to, configure your phone or, or computer to give those to you. And if you... Uh, and if you know how to switch that over, that would be great. Let us know. <laughs> Sylvan Westby writes, so since Pamela now might have some uh, NASA funding, does that mean she speaks for NASA to confirm aliens? Or can she at least announce a rescue mission to get Mark Watney back? Um, so I do have NASA funding coming. This show is not paid for by the NASA funding. I'm speaking strictly as human being, Pamela Gay, who has a PhD, but sometimes screws up. Um, and Mark Watton isn't actually there, but if he was, I'd be all for announcing a rescue mission. That'd be great. Yeah, this show is paid for by our time. And, well, yeah. yeah and, and donations. And, and the donations. Our, 
when when you guys get to see us at various events, when you see us at DragonCon, at Balticon, all of those different things, that's paid for through donations. Preston is paid for through donations. Preston is awesome. Please donate that we can help Preston keep doing this. We are organized by Susie. Uh, without Susie, we would both die. Um, there is a whole host of people that that keep us going. We volunteer our time, but we like to pay the people who keep us sane. Okay, Elad Abrams said I should do my best Giorgio A. Tsoukalos impression, and I have no idea who that is, but now apparently that's the, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. So I hope we, we worked that in for you and and uh, got that done. Is that that guy with the really big the hair? crazy that hair, they, yeah. They keep making memes of? Yeah, yeah, it's been around it's for a long time. Aliens, okay. Apparently I'm uh, not imitation. Elad also says, that, according to John Oliver, it's illegal for anyone not from Canada to tell everyone from Canada to either vote or not. So, but I am from Canada, and so I told you to vote. Canadians. I'm from America, and I'm going to vote when we have our elections. Um, Clear, we're both from America. I'm from the United States. He's from Canada. Uh, North America, yeah. All right, let's see. Uh... So Michael Jobin says that CMEs would worry me in a Dyson sphere. So these are coronal mass ejections. Uh, yeah, yes. that would be a worrisome because someone's getting nuked. Nuked. You need so a Dyson sphere around a nice calm red dwarf star would be a happier place. They wouldn't want to do it with a solar type star. But you're still getting a blast of radiation from from but them. The the probability, because red dwarfs are much calmer. But you're not going to, for sure, but you're not going to get any, you know, there's no magnetosphere, theoretically, within your Dyson sphere, unless you've cooked up some way to, to yeah. do this. So so you're exposed to space. But, you know, yes. obviously. Small problems. Yeah, if you've dismantled your solar system uh, and, in, and reorganized it into some kind of collection system, you've figured out the radiation problem. Um, so Tom Nathy notes that also in Finding ET, if they're still using radio to broadcast into space and you'll still have the inverse square law and the interstellar dust that absorbs the signal. So, uh, you know, just that, uh, that, that you're not going to have an easy way of, of transmitting over long distances using, using radio because of the inverse square law. It's got to be point to point. And so I, I'm going to. Oh, so your video is degrading and my Dropbox is going insane because apparently you're uploading like 10 million .au files. I know what that is. Okay, I will, oh. shut, I will shut it down. Here, hold on. There, I paused my okay. syncing. Okay. I, sa I saved my stuff onto the Dropbox folder and now the Dropbox is, is going crazy, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Thomas Schranecker notes, and I think this is a good point, is that even a megastructure is going to have a periodic timing to it. And so this is one of the weird things, right, about these about these transits that we're seeing is that they, they didn't have a periodic timing in the way you would anticipate for some kind of planet. So if there was some great big alien space station, wouldn't that still have a periodic... Well, so, so there's a difference between the individual things not having a periodicity and the entire thing appearing non-periodic at first look. So for instance, if, if I treat my microphone, sorry, those of you who are listening, like a planet, you might have something that is in a precessing orbit. So as it goes around, the orientation changes. So now you're going to see an eclipse, but an eclipse that's rapidly precessing around the world. You might have something else that's going equatorially around in their time so that they never collide. They're the same size, the same distance. How do you decouple that if you only have the set of observations when something goes in front? So if you have a variety of different objects, all of them with a complex orbit that isn't something that we're used to seeing because solar systems naturally come with everything orbiting in one direction in one plane. If you have something more complicated than that, um, it could be that 
each individual thing has a periodicity and we can't figure out what the heck is going on looking at the dips which appear non-periodic? Um, let's see. There's a difference between the way things appear and the way they are, I guess, is the way to put it. Uh, Guido Bieber notes, whatever was going on at that star, it happened 1,500 years ago. Curse you, slow speed of light. So true. Uh, you know, with, with nearby stars, it's not that much of a problem. But yeah, when you think about it, like if we did detect a... Uh, another galaxy that was giving off that really strange infrared signature that that would mean that you know th but it's six million light years away to 100 million light years away it happened a hundred million years ago yeah so dead. they're dead they, they're dead or maybe what looks like or they've spread to other galaxies you're seeing one galaxy but now they're at 40 you right. don't know so it's so that's exactly right the 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 speed of light is a, is a big problem we actually talked about that in um when we did that the the symposium at, at osu yeah this idea about you know when you look out into space and you look at the stars are the stars still there and there's that meme that goes around which i'm sure you've seen where it's like you know when you look up into the sky and you see the stars they're actually dead yeah you know, like your dreams but that's not true, right? All the stars that you see, they're all still there because they've only, you know, you're only seeing them a few hundred to maybe a few thousand years old and the chances of any of those being exploded are pretty low. Well, so, it's you know, possible that like Eta Carina or Betelgeuse are yeah. exploded. But so so I think it, it's more accurate to say 99% of the ones that we're looking at are probably still there. Um. John Marcello says, uh, Paul is great on the Weekly Space Hangout and his Ask a Space Band podcast. Agreed. Paul is the greatest. Hey. Subscribe. Hey. Second greatest? Another uh, great. Another great. He's yeah. awesome. He's very excellent. No ranking. Um, okay. So Thomas Tranaker says that uh, alien species will build a hyperport and will matter into existence and build new planets. So, yeah, there you go. That's what's going to happen. So, um, Hugo Burnham says, where would all the raw materials for a Dyson megastructure come from from the first place? Uh, remember that solar system that we dismantled? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's no more Jupiter, no more Saturn. Gather all the rocks, gather all of the ice. Process it. Yeah. Process it. Yeah. There's like 45 times the mass of the Earth inside Jupiter. There's, you could just dismantle Jupiter and have tons of more Earths. Should. Jupiter. <laughs> um, Richard Strassel asks, would a Dyson sphere have to be solid or could it be some kind of lattice? A lot of the graphics that you actually see floating around the internet right now show a lattice and it, this in, in a lot of ways makes a lot of sense because you don't need as much. It's easier to maintain the structural integrity if you keep the mass down. Um, it just makes it both more and less complicated simultaneously. Yeah. I, I think one contiguous structure is probably not feasible i think that's the thinking is that it's just not feasible that you need that you need separated objects that aren't yeah. trying to make some large single thing um a geodesic sphere surrounding a star that has stuff built onto it is not as strong as building a bunch of orbiting things. So uh, Lars Wright did follow up uh, and said, uh, next to the subscribe button on YouTube, there's a small dim settings icon leading to a notification toggle. So cool. you can actually go wherever you, wherever you subscribe to things and you can set a notification. Um, Richard Strassel asks, what sort of signature would you expect from a system being consumed by von Neumann machines? So that's the that's that idea of computers and robots dismantling solar systems. So would would that give off some kind of structure that would or some kind of signature that would be different from uh, you know one that's already established in place? I, I off the top of my head, I don't think so. 
Yeah, you would. I mean, I guess if you watched over time, the signature of any transiting planets would change. Yeah. As more, and then the signature of of the the cloud of. But a snapshot. I can't imagine in a snapshot that you'd see anything. Yeah. Um. Uh, Elad Avron says that I imagine solar wind would be a huge structural issue as well. Say that again. The solar wind, try you know if you build a Dyson sphere. Oh and right, the sun, the solar pressure wind, pushing out. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. More reasons not to make it a solid object. I mean, so if you think about it, it's essentially like the inside wall of a balloon. Um, it it would exert a force, so you'd have to have the divots to let the pressure out. Yeah. Our house painters are making noise outside that is slightly distracting. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I think I got all the uh, all the main questions there. I'll just see if there's anything else over on uh, on the event page. Um, apologies to everyone for last week. We try not to be chaos. Have a show, yeah. But that's that's sort of the background of our lives. Um, okay, I think that's it. I think we're going to wrap this up. Pamela, thank you once again, as always, for uh, joining me. It's strange to not be in the same physical location. It with was you again nice. Now. Yeah, it was good to sit around a table and just yak with, with, uh, with Paul to do a live episode, and then just to do all the hanging out, which was great. So yeah. it was nice to see you, and all of the fans who actually met us in OSU, which was great. That was cool. And so, uh, okay, thank you, Paul. Ohio State University, for hosting us. Yay! Uh, and I have no plans for the next couple of months. So hopefully we'll, it'll be regular episodes of Astronomy Cast from here on out. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks everyone. We'll see y'all later. Bye.